director of the Clemson Human Factors Institute. His primary research interests center on the psychological factors surrounding the design and use of autonomous technology, human-robot interaction, anthropomorphic interfaces, and age-related changes in cognitive abilities. Um, he, in addition, over 30 publications in this field, he has a new co-edited collection with Anne McLaughlin, yeah, um, coming out this fall, titled Aging, Technology, and Health, and the title of his presentation today is Understanding and Designing for the Future, How to Avert Skynet. Um, so he'll speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll take some questions, so make sure to take some cool notes, um, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm really excited to do this talk, especially with this audience, uh, because it's such a diverse audience. And I've never, and because of that, it's reflected in this talk, which is a little bit different than what I typically get, in that it's a very conceptual talk. Uh, it's a, the bulk of it is actually conceptual, and then I'm going to end with uh, some studies that we're doing that you can cover me with questions about. Uh, you are Demister, uh, who is sort of floating right now, right now he's, a, he's on the market, but he's at GMU right now. Uh, he and I uh, sort of got together at a conference because we were working in similar areas of like technology. It was only later that we discovered that we both had a love of uh, film and cinema, specifically uh, dystopian sci-fi movies, which heavily informs our work, as you'll see. Uh, also, I want to acknowledge the students working on this project, uh, Dan, Jeremy, and Spencer. Uh, uh, without their help, of which this uh, work is not possible. So, uh, by the way, you can stop me at any point if you have clarification questions or if you have any complaints. So, just as an overview, there's sort of this talk is in general split up into two parts. The first part is uh, the rationale for uh, the second part. And the first part, I have it sort of in the form of a mathematical equation, which is in the future, autonomous, not right now, but in the future, autonomous systems uh, will be rational and they will soon be super intelligent, uh, being flushed with lots of data. And humans, uh, we don't change very quickly. We're very irrational and we're highly emotional. And when you have those two things together, you get the end of the world. Part two, which is where some of the of the science comes in, is uh, a lot of speculation. It's actually heavy speculation about what will future autonomy look like, future autonomous systems. Now, uh, I'll get to that in a And sort of the ending part of the talk is, given how we think future autonomy might look like, what can we do at any time to avert the sort of the disaster scenario we see? Now I'll sort of end with a couple of slides of studies that are in progress. So uh, some of you might not know this, but I'm, a, uh, I'm an engineering psychologist. I'm in the human factors program in the psychology department. And it, uh, human factors is a kind of uh, applied psychology. I identify as an engineering psychologist, which is slightly different. But I study human capabilities and limitations, primarily cognitive and mental capabilities and limitations, and how those uh, capabilities and limitations come into play when people interact with complex systems. And I uh, have been trained in and I use the scientific method, which basically means I do experiments. So, next, uh, I want to talk about four trends. I'm not being particularly uh, you know, original. These are four trends that everybody knows about, but these are four trends that are, that are particularly salient to today's conversation. The first trend is big data, which is a term you might have heard before, which basically means data is being collected about you and everybody on this planet, and tons of it. Uh, for example, this watch I'm wearing measures my heart rate every 10 minutes. A phone measures my location every, I don't know, a couple of seconds. Those are small scale. Every purchase you buy, every, every website you visit, all this stuff, health data, location data, all this stuff. Uh, and then wrap that up you know, exponentially. Data is being collected, stored somewhere. Some of it might be going into uh, neural networks, deep, machine, uh, deep or machine learning neural networks. and. Um, you know, the interesting thing about neural networks, I'm sure there's people in the audience that know way more about this than I do, but when I was in grad school, we called these connectionist networks, and they were very theoretical, and they didn't do much. They were able to detect colors. But with the advent of processing capacity, uh, primarily GPUs, they just exploded. They are now in your phone. And these deep learning machine, deep and machine learning networks actually have access to a lot of big data. What's going on? Another interesting side note is, uh, Whenever you hear about you know uh, machine learning or deep learning, you know for example, 
in, in your phone, it can detect faces in your photo album. Uh, we don't actually know what it's learning. There's a hidden layer which is not visible to the programmer or to the you know, person designing it. So we're not actually quite sure what it's learning, we just know it's learning. Not quite sure what, especially when it gets to complex numbers. The other trend is uh, ubiquitous automation. So uh, automation is uh, extremely prevalent. I just, my, my car engine uh, blew up a couple months ago and I had to get a new car, and practically everything in the car is automated from high beams to wipers to rain keeping to um, uh, cruise control and more. And that's just in a car. If you think about daily life, there are lots of little things that are automated. So automation has become ubiquitous and sort of hidden. We're not quite aware. Of and finally, the last trend is uh, occupations are becoming much more complicated, more complex. Uh, that is, they're moving from physical labor being the limiting factor to cognitive labor being the limiting factor. Partially the reason for this is uh, it's easy to automate manual labor. And this is part of, you know, it's, it's, I'm not getting into the philosophical or political aspects of it, but um, uh, a lot of physical physical manual labor jobs are being automated simply because it's easy to do, and that's what the automation is good at. In the future, you know, my job might soon be automated. I don't see that coming anytime soon, but uh, you know, more complicated jobs will soon be automated. So it's sort of a vicious, vicious circle. As manual labor jobs become automated, we introduce more automation. And as the automation learns more about all the big data, it becomes more complicated and starts subsuming more complicated jobs. So these are four trends that sort of could potentially lead to uh, weird situations, unusual situations. I don't want to say deadly situations, but uh, very unpredictable situations in an unpredictable future. And so it's that is a background that I want to talk about a little bit about my motivation and my research. So uh, human behavior with AI. By the way, I'm using the term AI and automation and autonomy sort of interchangeably, but there are subtle differences. So, so AI by itself might not have autonomy. Autonomy is the ability to act on its own. But, but for now, we'll just use them interchangeably. So human behavior with AI or autonomy or automation is um, <clears throat> kind of irrational and counterintuitive. It's not um, what you think it should be. You know, when you introduce automation in a, in a system that involves humans, humans start acting unusually. And so, you know, that's now. What happens when the AI or automation becomes even more advanced? And so AI is an AI and automation and autonomy is a frequent theme in uh, movies. So this slide just shows you some old movies as well as the very recent movies that, that feature the theme of AI or autonomy. You know, the classic one is 2001. I'm sure most of you have seen it or heard of it. How is the protagonist in that movie? Uh, another classic one from the 80s is Blade Runner. The replicants were essentially robots. And then newer movies that feature AI. Now, uh, what's one feature of, of all these movies? That is, what happens at the end? They're all sad. <laughs> sad to put it mildly, <laughs> this is what happens. <laughs> Essentially, right? The end of the world. This is from Terminator, um, the latest Terminator. Um, you know, and I'm being uh, purposefully overly dramatic, but essentially bad things happen, right? Bad things happen when humans interact with AI. Uh, at this point, you might be thinking to, your, thinking to yourself, uh, dude, these are movies, you need to chill out. <laughs> You're kind of crazy. <laughs> You really need to uh, step away from the movie screen and get back to the uh, data analysis. Uh, well, that's true. I admit that. But you know, I'm not the only one sort of saying that. And I'm certainly not the first one saying that. There are a lot of non-crazy smart guys who uh, are sort of putting out the warning signal that uh, you know we should be a little bit careful about playing with really hyper advanced AI. Even though right now it's quite dumb, uh, the future is a little bit unclear. So these guys uh, signed a letter along with hundreds of scientists um, put up at the Future Flight Institute that basically said, um, hey, hey, AI scientists, slow your roll. We need to sort of look at the morality of this and figure out what they can do. 
and how much power they have. And they basically said, this is in very mild language, but the full letter is much stronger. They basically say it is important to research how to reap its, that is, AI's benefits, while avoiding the potential pitfalls. But again, very mild language, but the full letter is a little bit more obvious. Any questions so far? Okay, so how can I, as a human factors person, a little lowly human factors person, uh, prepare for the future? And given the future hasn't happened, how can I shape it? So, the question that I ask myself generically, you and I, you and I ask ourselves, is uh, how will humans behave with autonomous systems that are even more autonomous, potentially even smarter, than the clumsy automation that we have right now? That is, and once we do that, we can um, use this information to build, you know, have, have a say in designing autonomy or autonomous systems for the future that um, won't result in you know, San Francisco blowing up. Uh, you know, it's a little bit of a role reversal because people like me, human factors people, are traditionally brought in after systems are designed to clean up the mess, and we're saying we don't want to do that anymore. We want to be, we want to join the party before the system is designed. So let's talk about this. We just look to the future. Let's come back to the present and talk about automation or autonomy as it exists today. Automation, uh, while it might. Uh, do behavior that seems intelligent or smart, like you know, imagine Siri or the cruise control in your car. Automation as, as it exists today, even highly advanced automation that the military might use, is quite narrow, clumsy, and brittle. What I mean by narrow is it serves a very limited function and it can't do much beyond its program function. Uh, it's clumsy in that the decisions that it makes are not very precise. Uh, they're based on input data, which could be kind of compromised. They're brittle. That is, when they fail, they fail catastrophically. They stop working. Uh, a good, good, very salient example of that is my delayed keeping in my car. Uh, if it can't detect the lines, it just turns off. It doesn't warn me. It doesn't degrade gracefully. It just stops working. It doesn't tell me, except for a little, little indicator light. And for a lot of these reasons, uh, human automation interaction is actually a little bit complicated. What I mean by that is I'm presenting two views. Uh, one set of studies shows that users, humans, tend to under rely on automated aids, even when it's harmful to their self interest to do so. So that's kind of weird. On the other side, under the spectrum, users also tend to over rely on automated aids, even when it harms them. That is, it's bad to use it. So we got these two sets of studies, and this is what I mean by human automation interaction. It's really complicated. It's counterintuitive. It's just weird. People act really weird with automation. So uh, the key thing that explains these results is uh, this concept of trust, which is, um, you know, it's a, it could be considered an emotion. It's certainly human. But the extent to which the human trusts the machine uh, determines whether they under rely or over rely. And we, we, we want humans not to do either one of those things, right? We don't want them to over rely because when it fails, they're left out of the lurch. And we don't want them to under rely because they can't do the task themselves and they really could use the help. A good example of that is um, think of older adults managing their health. They could really use the help of some kind of aid that maybe helps them figure out what to eat or when to exercise, but they don't trust it, so they don't use it, they're not deteriorating. So that's an example of underlines. So in this graph I have here, uh, it sort of helps to try to explain these zones of overtrust, undertrust, overreliance, underreliance. Where it, where might it come from? So distrust might actually come from the actual reliability of the system is quite high. It's a reliable system; it works well. But for some reason, the people perceive it to be much lower. That leads to a state of undertrust, distrust, and therefore underreliance. Over behavior. Similarly, uh, you might have a system that's actually quite unreliable, but people, for some reason or another, uh, believe it's more reliable than it actually is. And that leads to a state of overtrust or over reliance. So, a good example here is uh, GPS systems. You know, occasionally in the news you'll hear pop up people driving off a bridge because they follow the GPS. Um, uh, that's a classic example of over trust because it's actually not very reliable, the roads are not well mapped but they believe it's better mapped than it is. 
So trust is pretty key, uh, pretty important uh, human side of the equation thing that we have to sort of understand and figure out how to manage if we want to enhance human autonomy coverage. Any questions so far? Yeah. I was just wondering if you had to report the other one, like if we don't trust it, but it's all like a person. I'm trying to think of it. Yeah, why don't you all know, give me an example? Can anybody give me an example of a system that's actually quite reliable, but for one reason or another, people don't use it as much as they probably should? Yeah. Autopilot in airplanes. Autopilot in airplanes. Yeah, people tend to be very distrustworthy of that. They think they can buy it, so very, very good. Yeah, so that's, you know, that would be a good one if I had statistics on the amount of times pilots actually switched off uh, autopilot. But yeah, that would work, definitely. Are we talking about whether the pilot's trusted or whether the... Whether that's a good question. That's, that's a good question. Uh, who do you think would trust it more? Uh, yeah, how, why? They know from experience that it works. Exactly. Or they also, know it's the probably, right? You know, they're probably really, really encouraged to use it. Yeah, there might, they're actually, uh, aviation is kind of weird because it's so highly regulated. There might be laws that, that say they have to use it. Also, the, I mean, there's the pilot and co pilot, so they always have each other to answer to. Yeah, or, exactly. you know, also, autopilot, uh, this is an example of where you guys might be overestimating the capability of autopilot. Autopilot is actually quite a dumb automation system. Um, it's basically uh, less advanced than the cruise control in my new car. <laughs> Uh, that's how it, it's basically meant for flying in um, straight lines. Yeah, but it's easy. It's easier to fly than it is. That's true. That is true. Exactly. Yep. And it's actually probably in the future easier to automate that than to automate a self-driving car. So, uh, any other, does that answer your question? Uh, another example of this, and the example that I hesitated to give because it's not quite, uh, it doesn't resonate with a lot of people, is uh, frequently the military contacts me. And they often have, you know, intelligence analysts who basically look at ship movements or, you know, other stuff to detect unusual patterns. And that's a very data-intensive job. And uh, they give them intelligence analyst tools, and the intelligence analysts won't use it because they don't know what's going on under the hood. So that's an example of distrust. It's actually quite reliable. It's not doing heavy lifting, but for some reason or another, they just don't. They perceive it as unreliable. So they're always, they're always coming to me saying, why aren't these people using it? Why are they turning it off? How do we get them to use it? How do we get them to <coughs> Because it's a high workload task without it. OK, any questions? All right, so, so trust is the, the main thing here. We've got to sort of figure out how to manage it. So jumping back into the future again, what will future autonomy look like? Uh, we know we have a good experience with what current autonomy looks like. Again, you experience a lot. Most of us have it in our phones. You know, Siri and Alexa are good examples of very basic levels of uh, AI autonomy. But what will the future look like? Because that's really what I'm more interested in. So, in order to sort of answer this question, uh, you know, uh, as scientists, uh, we are bound by the literature, <laughs> and we can't really go beyond much the literature because we have we sort of have to you know, use what's out there. And we can't jump ahead hundreds of years in the future because that's not what scientists do. But, uh, but that's what we did. So what we did was we revisited sci-fi uh, because we really wanted to know what will it look like. That's supposed to represent you and I. Sort of <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we really, we, in order to sort of figure out where autonomy is headed, we um, you know, drew inspiration from sci-fi which has no limitations, right? They, they can just go crazy in terms of future possibilities, right? They tend to be dystopian, but you know, set that aside for now. So after careful analysis of you know, a certain set of movies, um, as well as sort of the literature, you know, this wasn't completely devoid of science, we sort of determined that um, two characteristics that might be important or that are present in future examples of autonomy are uh, autonomy, which is the capability to make plans or decisions on its own. That is the extent to which it can operate without you. And the other one is sort of a new one that we sort of came up with, and it's called humanness. And it's the ability uh, 
to connect with the human either through appearance uh, or communication. And by the way, humanness does not equate to anthropomorphism, which is something you might have immediately thought of, but that's just anthropomorphism, you didn't make that up. We're trying to distinguish that because autonomy itself is actually a form of anthropomorphism. That is, when a system starts exhibiting autonomy or agency, it's doing stuff on its own, we automatically attribute anthropomorphic qualities to it. Well, humanness is not that. Humanness is abilities, appearance, capabilities that allow to explicitly communicate with humans. A good example of, of that contrast is, uh, most of you guys have seen Star Wars, right? One of the six Star Wars, uh, seven, eight, I don't know. I, <laughs> I sort of lost track of the sixth one. Uh, compare R2-D2, which if you remember is the trash can that just beeps. <laughs> C3PO, which is a humanoid robot with the fat pox. And C3PO was actually a robot designed explicitly for the purpose of human communication. He was a protocol, a protocol story, right? He was designed to help people and machines talk together. Whereas R2D2 was explicitly not designed to do that. Therefore, it does not speak language, it doesn't look like a human. So, uh, that, in a sense, encapsulates roughly our conception of humanness. Now, when we take these two dimensions and um, Put it up in graphical format, and we add existing examples of uh, you know automation, AI, or autonomy. You see some examples here. So we got humanness on the x-axis and autonomy on the right axis. And um, you know there are robotic pets out there. They're not really commonly available, but uh, I go the Sony dog, which some of you might have heard of. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? It's just it's just a robot dog. That's all it is. It doesn't do much. It's just a robot dog. <laughs> it, it will score high. Oh, Impero is a robot seal. It's a fuzzy seal. I don't think it's, been, it's available to, consumer, to the consumer, but it's available for research purposes. And it's just a fuzzy seal that's meant to give companionship to people. That's Impero. They score high on humans because they're explicitly designed to connect with humans. They have design features explicitly for that purpose. They actually score relatively low on autonomy because they, they don't do much. You know, Paro is really is a robot teddy bear. That's essentially what it is. Uh, some other examples uh, that are clustered down here are Alexis, you know, all the voice assistants that we have nowadays, uh, Baxter, the manufacturing robot, uh, and then other robots. They actually score relatively low on both humanness and autonomy because, they, again, they don't do much on themselves. They're, they're essentially tools. And they don't score super high on humanness, although Alexa and Siri might score a little bit higher because at least they sound human and they have humor, that kind of stuff. But in the grand scheme of things, they're actually relatively low on humanness. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Deep Blue, which is IBM's supercomputer, um, and then AlphaGo, which is the uh, Google's um, network that recently beat the first human Go player. And then we have Stuxnet, which is uh, Kind of unusual to see on there, but it's that virus that infiltrated Iran's um, nuclear power plants. Uh, the reason it's high on autonomy, it was actually meant to, uh, on its own, sort of adapt to local conditions without humans intervening. It was programmed to do that. And then at the highest level, it's hypothetical. The, uh, if most of you, if you don't know about self driving cars, there's various levels defined by the government. Level five self driving car is a car where you can input a destination and it will take you where you need to go completely autonomous. It doesn't exist yet. And there are estimates as to when it will exist. Um, I would go for high estimates. It's actually a really hard task to do. Uh, the, the highest level we have right now is level three. So level five self-driving car scores super high on autonomy. Now, these are existing technologies. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. We heard some of the weaponized robots, such as the things being developed by Boston, Others, wherever there's still a seal. Because they interact with humans in an you know, yeah. way, but you know, so I would have to know more about it, but like the you know, if you've seen you, you might want to YouTube videos of Boston Dynamics robots, but the, like the dog robots, the pack bot, it's actually really interesting. Uh, I don't think they would score super high on humanness, because they're not you know, they're not designed to communicate to you. They're designed, to, they're, they're tools. They're basically robots that look like dogs, like giant pit bulls. 
Uh, they didn't score super high in autonomy either, but I, I say that with an asterisk because I don't know too much super uh, super lot about. I don't know if the, uh, the soldier has to actually program the um, destination, and if so, then it's going to really be low on its own, right? Or it can actually uh, navigate uh, a battlefield on its own, which I don't think it would do. Similarly, uh, you know, uh, Roombas are score super low on humanness and super low on autonomy too. Questions? All right, so with this graph as a basis, mapping on existing technologies, we then mapped on non-existing technologies. <laughs> and what we have here, I don't know if this is visible, uh, are uh, some non-existing technologies. <laughs> so yeah, if you can't see, I don't know if you can see very well, but so I'll, I'll, I'll describe these four projects. When you add on these non-existing future examples of autonomy, you actually start to get four quadrants, four distinct quadrants. The first one that we just talked about are tools. They're dumb tools. It might look smart, but they're dumb tools. <laughs> if you increase the amount of humanness and autonomy, you actually start getting into um, uh, fictional tools like Jarvis, who uh, is highly autonomous and has a moderate amount of humanness. Except for the latest movie where he actually had a human form. <laughs> Forget that. We didn't see that. Uh, then, you have, <laughs> then you have other movies. That example of Jarvis would score super high on humans, right? Uh, so that's the uh, tools part. That's sort of where we are now. If we ramp up humanness to its uh, maximum level while keeping autonomy constant, we get other examples or for other examples of autonomy. Uh, the highest example might be uh, David from AI, who didn't have super high levels of autonomy. He needed a helper to complete his task. The gigolo robot, if you remember. But uh, he was designed explicitly for the purpose of companionship. That's super high uh, humanness. And then you have other examples like Wally, uh, uh, her from uh, Samantha from her, and C3PO. That's the that zone, that quadrant is what we call companions. Uh, they're ultimately they ultimately uh, end up being useless toys. They're not super helpful, uh, but they're useless toys. If you look at the, uh, if you ramp up autonomy while keeping humanness constant, you get the zone of avoidance. <laughs> so you, get avoid. you get a how, which is an evil AI, a replicants, which are evil androids, and Skynet, which is an evil uh, present entity. Uh, that's what happens when you ramp up autonomy to its highest level without really messing with humanness. And then finally, in the upper right, you have the balance of humanness and autonomy, which we term useful entities, and there's not a huge amount of examples there. Data is one example. Data actually falls along the perfect, uh, <clears throat> this is not mathematical. Data, data <laughs> falls <laughs> I warned you. Uh, data falls near the line, the ideal balance between autonomy and humanness. And one of the reasons is if you, if you uh, watch enough Star Trek Next Generation, you know, data has a lot of human qualities, including morality and ethics, and in later uh, examples, emotions. Those are classic human cues, right? So he's not just the dumb robot like Rubikis, who are sort of human, uh, sociopathic. And then the other ones that we have listed there are sort of hypothetical, theoretical. So if you, if you take both dimensions up to their highest level, and you have essentially an oracle, an all-knowing being, which, you know, that's thousands of years in the future. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking like it's certain. I don't know. <laughs> so, if, you know, one interesting thing about, if you look at the current technologies and the zone of avoidance, that's where we're headed. You know, these, these are sort of in temporal order. That is the order in which they were developed. We're, you know, those engineers are rapidly developing technologies that are super high in autonomy and, and becoming higher, while sort of ignoring the humanist part, right? And that's where we're headed, is straight toward terminating territory. Where, we, where in reality, we want to be sort of in the, in the uh, middle, right? The useful friendly Any questions? Comments? Yeah. So, that, that's, that would be awesome. I love sci-fi. 
Is there like um, a certain uh, prejudice there towards the, the better quality of homeless? Because you see the more human it is, the less likely to be avoided. But it's really more some of the worst of parts of being human. But the, the bad characteristics uh, and maybe that's where they get it. But, uh, you know, the human dimension is uh, it's not evaluative. In other words, it's not meant to say good or bad. It's just meant to discuss uh, characteristics, that is, appearance, behavior, etc., that allow it to talk with humans, communicate with humans. So we don't really make evaluative assumptions about good humanist cues and bad humanist cues. These are just cues that could be used in a bad way or a good way. And in fact, I'm, I'm mainly talking about using these cues in a good way to facilitate communication with humans, but they could be used in a bad way as well, right? To deceive humans. So, so someone like Lord, just like an evil version of David, would still be in a useful friendly answer. Yeah, actually, good point. So, look, you know, for those of you who don't, don't know, Lore is his twin brother, who is <laughs> evil. And uh, he would actually still be here. Because he had the exact same, he was the exact same robot, it's just he right? yeah. So he would still be where data is. Any questions? So, uh, so where, where are we today? So how do we confuse powerful autonomy with humanist characteristics? And I just put up the definition again with, of, of what humanist is. Uh, well, in order to do that, we sort of have to figure out what, what are the examples. You know, what is humanist, right? We have, a, we have a formal definition, but there are lots of different ways it can manifest itself, right? Uh, one of the ways it, it can manifest itself is a way that you've probably encountered um, recently. Uh, whenever you ask Siri to do something and it can't do it, what does it do? It typically apologizes, right? And you've seen this in movies as well, right? <laughs> Classic example. Dave looks super angry in this clip. And then because of, because you know Al's disobeying his orders and says I'm sorry, he disconnects. <clears throat> so this is one human cue that we're particularly interested in at this point. Uh, managing and repairing trust back to that trust issue by using apology. And so it's a very unique humanist cue that machines currently have the ability to do, but they do it in a very dumb way. And in fact, when machines apologize to you, you probably just roll your eyes, right? It's very uh, non-genuine because it's a it's a it's a um, program pre-programmed response. So for that reason, we dismiss it. But what if it wasn't a pre-programmed response, and what if it was more responsive to the situation, to the system, the kind of violation that occurred, and to who it was talking to? What if the response it gives, the apologetic response, or denial response, by the way, was more responsive to all these situations? Now, you might be asking yourself, uh, why would you want to repair trust in this way? Well, you know, jumping ahead just a couple of years into the future, once we figure out the dynamics of trust and how they manipulate, how they get manipulated through apology, here's one plausible scenario. This blue line indicates uh, trust over time with the user using some system, maybe a self-driving car. And occasionally the car will do something where it'll violate your trust, and your trust will therefore go down, but eventually over time it'll go back up. But you know what? It gets into a car wreck, major violation, and your trust plummets. And it takes a long time for trust to recover on its own. It just takes time. Well, what if we can accelerate that process using some uh, trust recovery mechanism like an apology. There might be one type of apology that uh, results in extremely fast recovery, or maybe a different kind of apology, or even perhaps a denial that results in uh, a delay but similarly fast recovery. So these are just three examples of trust recovery dynamics that could occur if the system was smart enough to intervene. Uh, that is, either apologize or deny. Does anybody have any questions? Aren't there certain levels of uh, you, were, you, you kind of framed the, in the beginning, it's like, how are they 
uh, where is this going? Okay, I mean, there's already problems where it's at right now, but nobody's really discussing any kind of protection because there's we have all these devices and they're creating more and more devices. You go to Home Depot and they have refrigerators and washing machines that can scan the products you're using and sending you emails telling you to buy this detergent versus that one or this ketchup versus that one. And it becomes like an invasion of privacy issue. And nobody's really discussing that. And that's that's just a basic tenet that could be uh, could be discussed and presented now, but nobody's talking about. It. Yeah, there's a as you mentioned, there's a ton of issues surrounding a lot of this. And you know, the disaster scenario that I presented earlier actually could be the result of lots of reasons, right? Not just uh, homicidal AI. It could be due to miscommunication. Uh, and, and that's primarily what we targeted is maybe the AI, you know, if, you, if you watch the Terminator movies, the AI actually had a good intent. It just went about it in a really bad way. It, you know, it, it, it was originally designed to you know, automate missile batteries in order to preserve itself. And if it assumed a threat, it decided it would kill you. Well, there's constitutional issues. Lot, exactly. This is not a psycho, psycho, psychological only problem. This is a, and this is why the, the Future of Life Institute's uh, letter was particularly interesting because it was signed by scientists from all over. Uh, there, psychologists, human factors people were relatively silent on it, but uh, and this is sort of why I'm sort of interested in this area is I think we need a bigger voice in it. But I agree, it's a it's a big prop, it's a big potential problem that needs input from lots of different people. I wonder what other kinds of relational things would have to go into accepting somebody's apology, right? Because it's not like, okay, I'll forgive you because you know we make vows to each other and we're married to each other, right? There's none of that going on. It's just purely, um, it's still a machine in some ways. So how does what other kind of relational things would have to go in to it to make it more, like, to make it more? Um, I guess to make the apology more effective. So, by the way, to backtrack a little bit, the reason we're even looking at this is um, there's existing literature. There's existing literature in organizational behavior literature. So, um, you know, um, there's literature that shows that, uh, you know, when people are looking at job applicants, like through video interviews, and they find out that a job applicant actually lied on their resume, then they, they then look at whether the applicant apologizes or denies, and then they examine how the interviewer um, changes their opinion. And as you can imagine, you know, apologies and denials have different effects depending on the magnitude of the violation, depending on other characteristics. And so, you know, this first series of studies, we, we basically ask ourselves, uh, that pattern of results exists already. Uh, will that apply if one of the entities is a machine? Uh, and so this first set of studies we're doing is just straight up replication, conceptual replication. Uh, do you see what you see with human human, human human studies? Do you see that with human machine studies? And so um, we haven't looked at you know relationship dynamics, but we but it definitely would be interesting, right? Because earlier we talked about autopilots and pilots. That's a very formalized relationship where if the automation says to do something, you will probably do it because your company says you have to do it, you've been trained to do it, and you understand sort of its background, reliability, which I guess could be considered a kind of marriage, right? Sort of a forced arranged marriage. Oh, okay. between, I think there's more of a connection between Luke Skywalker and R2-D2 than there ever was between C-3PO. Yeah, interesting, right? But yeah. R2-D2 is less human, but there's relational stuff that happens. I agree, yes. Yeah. Um, maybe that was the intent to make it counterintuitive. That um, <laughs> the trash can that only beeps. <laughs> and it's because the trash can that only beeps was the one that relayed the message of the leader. Like, the CPO was just going to arrive with that. Who would want to be friends with him? So there's a book called The Effect of Apology by John Cador. Um, he talks about what makes what makes an apology effective is admitting fault. Yeah. Um, and so, what is the balance between um, the machine admitting fault and then liability? Then they're opening themselves up. To You're exactly liability. right. And where that comes to um, uh, <coughs> maximum fruition is in self-driving cars. 
But it's right. a mistake, and it did this, and it opens up the company to get sued, right? Right. 